Uh, today, talking about content security policy. Um, yeah, wrong direction on the slides. Uh, I'm Jeff. I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Uh, if you want to find me online, I'm Gapple on, Gapple on Drupal.org or GappleCA on Twitter. Um, if you're more interested in dogs or bikes, I'm also on Instagram and Strava. Um, it's where most of my free time is spent. Dogs or what? Dogs or bikes. I, I'm a... Road bikes or mountain bikes? Uh, mostly road bikes. Uh, I also have a fixed gear bike, which is a lot of fun, but a little scary at times. Yes. Um, <laughs> so today, uh, I'm going to start with a couple scary stories. Uh, I think three scary stories. Uh, kind of what happens. Uh, so this one... Uh, you know, a lot of providers, they say, you know, you want to add, add a library utility on your website. They just say, copy and paste this script, add it onto your website, and you're good to go. Uh, in this particular case, it was an accessibility tool. Um, there's a lot of federal guidelines around accessibility uh, becoming increasingly important as people are getting sued for not having accessible websites. Uh, so they offer this tool, say, hey, add this to your website and you know you don't have to worry about those federal guidelines so much uh, you're gonna be in better shape and you know you take a look at their script and they have something at the top to say hey you know we want to get out bug fix fixes features to you as quickly as possible uh, don't copy this otherwise you know you might be running an old copy and we can't support that there's a bit of a problem with that though in this case is one day this script shows up at the top and someone has gone into their asset server and inserted a crypto miner. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, estimates were about 5,000 sites. Users were visiting their page, downloading this new version of the JavaScript, and their CPUs are chunking away possibly fast enough to give someone a few uh, extra crypto coins. Um, and uh, in, in this case as well, like you can probably guess what sorts of websites have small budgets and strict accessibility requirements. Uh, in this case, a bunch of government websites, mostly informational, but UK, Australia, the US, um, are starting serving this. So pretty, pretty big deal. Uh, not the most dangerous thing that can happen. It's spinning up some extra CPU cycles, some anonymous person around the world is getting a benefit from it. Uh, but it's definitely not the worst that they can do. I mean, they're sending a request to, you know, they're loading some JavaScript, sending data wherever it needs to go. So, you know, what if you're an e-commerce website? What if you're processing transactions? Uh, this is a bit more of a targeted attack. Uh, I mean, last one was targeted too, uh, but this one they go into websites and where they can, they'll insert JavaScript to just siphon off form data. Um, they're specifically targeting credit card information, uh, but they're probably siphoning off every form they can and filtering it after the fact. So any sort of private information that someone's submitting, for a user's perspective, they're not even seeing anything different. The form still submits, the site operates as normal, but there's JavaScript that on form submit, it's getting sent somewhere else at the same time. And uh, and this is one of the stories that uh, kind of scared me and kicked me in the butt a little bit. Um, this is a, a really re well written article, potentially hypothetical, uh, where he talks about uh, asset libraries um, and dependencies. So when you're loading JavaScript, you're using NPM to build your packages, you have a bunch of uh, requirements for your tools that you're using. I mean, how often do you actually audit everything that goes into it, especially with a system like Node and NPM where there's a very complex chain of very small requirements. So the issue that he brings up is a concern is, you know, I snuck in an extra dependency to a common requirement and then change that dependency down the line. It was good at one point and now it's different. So a little bit of a different concern than you know, left pad uh, a few years ago where suddenly dependency disappeared and things broke. This is, you know, what if something gets snuck in? Um, how would you know about it? How would you be able to prevent it from doing the damage? So, I mean, you want your security on your website. Ideally, you want it to be like an onion. Uh, you want to have as many layers as possible. You know, if someone is trying to do something on your site, you want to give them more hoops to jump through. Uh, so this is where 
uh, Drupal gives you a bunch of tools out of the box to get you started. Uh, so things like input validation, if you have a form field that should only have a number, uh, the form API will give you warnings, won't accept a form submission. Uh, entity validation is at another lower level that's pretty important now in decoupled sites, is that if you try to save any entity through any means in Drupal, it'll go, hey, you're trying to save some random characters into a number of fields, we're not going to allow that. Um, so that kind of protects your content from being abused from form submissions. On the output side, you have the output filters like text formats for rich content and check plane filter cross-site access admin. Uh, those are the Drupal 7 uh, function names because they're easy to remember. Uh, but there's Drupal 8 analogs. And uh, a good improvement in Drupal 8 is that if any uh, plain text gets output into a template, Twig actually requires that it's kind of marked as safe beforehand, otherwise it escapes it. Um, giving you kind of an extra layer of protection. And then when you're passing information to JavaScript on the front end, uh, the Drupal settings system has been around for a long time where you can actually pass structured data to the front end to your JavaScript. Um, and you don't have to worry about injecting an inline variable into your page to be able to, for it to be used. Um, one of the other changes, uh, it's caused some people frustration, but I think it was a, a great change overall, is that in Drupal 8, the libraries API and the attachment system, um, you have to define in a library what script files are being added to your page, and the attachment system doesn't allow you to add arbitrary script files, URLs, CSS, or any inline JavaScript out of the box. So you kind of have to, there, there's ways around it. You can put inline JavaScript into your template files or you know some other things. Uh, if you really need to, uh, but is generally discouraged and it pushes you towards a better practice of making sure your JavaScript is in a file. Um, so this is a, a good presentation from Sam Mortensen a few years ago, uh, but as much as those layers are, there are ways to circumvent them. Um, whether it's inadvertent, uh, one of them is in Twig, if you don't quote, properly quote your attributes, um, that can allow a string to escape out of HTML and add arbitrary JavaScript. It can only escape things in the context that it knows that they need to be escaped. Um, as well as some more direct methods, like I mentioned, you know, opening inline JavaScript directly into the template. Um, there's some properties in the form API where you can just add arbitrary HTML onto the page. Um, so there might be good deliberate reasons to do that, or it might be just a developer taking a shortcut. and adding something in, they might feel that it's safe, but it does add a level of, of risk. Uh, and then on the user side, um, you know, the most common way you'll see is an example of a cross-site scripting attack is just add an alert statement somewhere into a text field. Um, so with those filtering layers in Drupal, um, you can't really do any sort of input validation on this because it's just arbitrary random text. Um, but the title field on an entity is always assumed to be plain text, and as long as that's continued to be respected, that's safe. Um, there's been some issues where that hasn't always been upheld, but it is uh, kind of a concern. Uh, but the bigger one here is that uh, for text formats, the full HTML that comes out of the box, if you add this, you're stating that you trust anyone that has permissions to have this field to put whatever they want. and when this is being put on the page, Drupal is marking it as safe to be exported. It's not filtered through Twig or any other system. Um, so you have to be aware of who has permission to this and what they can, can they do. Um, it might be just an inadvertent, someone copies and pastes something and breaks something on the site but doesn't do any damage. Um, but if you have someone more directly in attempting to attack your site, this can be an avenue for them to inject something, like take over a user account through whichever means and inject something that uh, can do damage or cause concern on the website, um, just because someone on the website has that permission. Uh, and then as safe as you are, there's always going to be security releases. Uh, Maybe you don't quite have your site patched up to date and something comes out. Maybe there's a security issue that you're not quite aware of yet. Um, thankfully, a lot of these are protected by permissions, so they're not just someone's running a script, crawling around the web, trying to inject things. Uh, 
those definitely get a very high warning and you'll hear about them, uh, patch them quickly. Um, but these are always going to pop up. So as safe as you are in your programming, auditing your code, managing your permissions on your website, there is still the risk of something that you don't know about popping up. Um, Cross-site scripting vulnerabilities are one of the most common uh, security releases that happen. And then the last one that I bring up is that some modules even deliberately have a field where a user can add inline JavaScript. Um, and it's the point of the module, and at best it's behind a flag on the permission screen saying this permission has security implications. Um, not particularly common, but some modules do that. It's part of their core feature set. So it's not really a security advisory issue if the module is deliberately having this, has a permission around it, that sort of thing. But as, as a developer, as a site administrator, it's something you have to look into that you know, the modules might not really advertise this as something that you have to, to be aware of to the extent that it does have a risk. Uh, so this is where uh, the content security policy header comes in. You know, the challenge with JavaScript is that the browser doesn't have a very complex trust model. It's, if there's JavaScript on the page, I need to run it, and I assume it's safe. So there's no differentiation between this is a file that's loaded from my website, and I assume it's a part of the website's kind of coded in packages, versus here's something that was copied and pasted into a text field and uh, echoed out onto the website. Uh, so content security policy adds an extra layer to say not just you know trust all JavaScript or block everything, but it allows you to say which sources of JavaScript are are trusted. Uh, the spec came out, uh, version two of the spec uh, was published in 2015, and at the time it was already supported by everything except Internet Explorer. So Microsoft Edge supported at the time. Uh, there's been a few bugs over the intermediate time, most of those have been fixed. Uh, and then it's still in draft mode, but there is a version three of the spec. Um, most of it is just a rewrite for browser implementers to make it more clear, uh, but there is a whole bunch of new um, kind of options in it to enable some more granular features and control uh, some newer technology on the web. Uh, it's by far best supported by Chrome. Uh, Firefox supports most of it, but not quite. It's a little lagging behind because it is a draft. Firefox doesn't uh, put as much emphasis on supporting those types of things. Uh, Safari and Edge I haven't seen any indications that they are kind of updating to support sort of newer version uh, three items in the spec. Uh, so it breaks down into just basically any sort of thing that you want to load on your website. Um, so it has kind of a default fallback that controls everything, and probably the most important ones that you care about, especially for, for security vulnerabilities, are the active content in, in scripts and styles. Um, so kind of two more specific directives. If you define either of those, they take precedence. If you don't, it'll fall back to the default. Um, so talk a little bit more is that you can use any of these as you need to. Um, so you can have a fallback to the default or not, only control your scripts. Um, and then any sort of other loaded content, fonts, images, media, is uh, anything loaded in an audio and a video tag. And then connect source is the other one. So you know, harvesting that credit card information, connect source with control, where JavaScript can retrieve and send information to. Um, so even if that script was loaded, connect source would say, okay, well, I'm not gonna let you send that information out, uh, and it would be blocked. And then there's a couple other attributes that um, don't control things that are loaded in the same way. Uh, there's a legacy header, uh, X-Frame Ancestors, um, that controls whether your site can be included in an iframe. Um, it's been supported for years in browsers, but it has kind of some limitations about uh, what functionality is. So in content security policy, it's a little bit more formalized and added some features to it so you can better control which particular sites can load your site into an iframe. Uh, and then you can actually control it in the other direction as well as what sites can be included in an iframe in your site. Um, so there's a different uh, directive around that one. Uh, 
So, as an example, uh, I'm just going to fire up uh, an instance of the uh, Umami profile. Uh, and you can see out of the box, load some images. Uh, there's some JavaScript behind the scenes too, but load some CSS. Uh, so, we'll just start just by locking everything down. Uh, close everything off uh, and see what happens. So, use that default source. So, we're going to add a header on for the quest. The name is the content security policy. Uh, and then there's the directive, default source, and special keyword of none. Uh, keywords are always in the, the single quotes. And it's just saying, block anything. I'm not going to make any exceptions to it. And we can see what happens as we just take our page back, uh, you know, 25 years in the web. <laughs> What's that? Where do you put that? Uh, so there's different ways to add it. Uh, when you're configuring the HT access, uh, file on your website, you can add header there is kind of the simplest one if you just have a basic header. <coughs> uh, you, you don't have HTX. <laughs> yeah, uh, so you can add it through your web server, through through HTX access or through the en Nginx, which unfortunately I'm not configured, I'm not as familiar with. Um, there's a, a Drupal event that modifies the response on the request. Um, so you can add it in there and then uh, there's a module as well. Um, but yeah, once it's added to the page, it blocks everything. So no scripts, no styles, no images, and less, in this case, those are inline SVGs, which are allowed, but, you know, that background image, which was a, a JPEG, is, is gone. But it's an interesting example, but it's not particularly useful. Uh, probably a better place to start from is the self keyword. Uh, so this dynamically says anything from our own domain, we consider safe. Uh, the limitation is that this is only like the specific top level domain, or not top level domain, the specific domain that your uh, website content is loaded from. It doesn't support subdomains, so if you are, you are using something like a CDN or splitting it across uh, domains for whatever reason, uh, you do have to separate those, you would have to specify those separately uh, for them to be enabled. Uh, and then if we load the site again, it is saying, you know, pretty much everything is local for our. Uh, styles, scripts, our images, they'll start to load just fine now. Uh, but if we pop open the, the browser console, we can see that we get a warning. Uh, and in this case, the Umami profile is loading fonts from the Google Font API. Uh, so we can he see here it's blocked. Uh, you can see in the menu in particular, it's loading this sans serif font, whereas normally it was a much nicer looking, thinner font. <coughs> So this is where you know, get into more specific directives. So we're loading styles. We want to allow our website with the self keyword. And then we can add whatever domains we want. Um, getting started, you can even just restrict it to say, I want to make sure that everything's loaded over uh, a secure connection with the HTTPS protocol. Um, or you can specify you know, the domain that things are coming from. So adding in the, the URL for the fonts API. Uh, and one step forward, one step back, uh, because fonts are different resources, now it's loading that CSS, it's trying to load every font file, the fonts are falling back to that default source directive that's blocking everything, and now every font file is still getting blocked. So no visual changes, we're getting a lot of errors in the log, but that's a pretty quick fix, is that we need them that other directive for, for font source. Um, in this case, since we're not loading any local fonts, we can emit that self-directive. It's not required to have any of those keywords. Uh, and we can just use the domain. One last load, and we're not getting any errors in the console. Um, and you can, if you recall in the past slides, now we have a, a thinner uh, font style on the, the menu uh, because they're loading. Uh, Obviously, the challenge there is that if you just deploy this out to production, you're probably breaking someone's functionality. You don't quite know what you might be hitting, especially if you have a more complex website with a lot of libraries that you're using. They might be making a request that you don't expect. Um, so in particular for Google Analytics as an example, its default way of tracking information is to load an image on the, t the page. And everything is attached onto uh, URL parameters in that image request. Uh, but it actually has another method where it uses JavaScript. And so 
most of the time it might be working fine, your analytics are tracking through those image requests, and then all of a sudden one of them is blocked because it's trying to use JavaScript. Uh, so there is this report only mode of the header that doesn't actually block anything, so user's experience isn't changed, but if you were to look at the browser console, it would show those errors that pop up of anything that would be blocked. And then as well is there's this directive uh, report URI that sends a message back to your server to say, hey, a visitor was visiting the website, they encountered a problem with our policy, and something would have been blocked um, in this case if it was enforced. Uh, so that way you can kind of test out those restrictions, gradually make it a little bit uh, more limited in what's allowed, and then make sure that you, your users aren't going to be negatively affected before you actually promote that to be uh, an enforced policy. Uh, so yeah, as I said before, uh, there is a Drupal module for this. Uh, so especially if you're a site builder, rather than having to mess around with your server configuration uh, or implement any code, uh, there is kind of the point and click option of just install a module. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite that easy, but it does give you these options where you can enable those separate policies, report only and enforced. Uh, so by default, when you enable uh, the module, it just does a report only, and you can check it in your browser, look through your console logs, or your site logs to make sure or that uh, you're not getting any unexpected reports. And then once you feel confident in that it's doing what you want, you can enforce it uh, and gradually iterate over that. And then I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things that I think is great about Drupal 8 is this library system. Uh, so the benefit of it, uh, this is a snippet from the Umami file, is that every source of JavaScript and CSS on your site is predefined in a library. Uh, so because of that, what the module is able to do is pull out and say, okay, well this module, this, uh, it is a module in this case, um, or a theme, uh, requires this particular uh, CSS file. Um, so it's a little small here, but when it's building out the full list of directives, it has uh, this auto sources field. So it's saying whenever there is a style source uh, directive added to the page, uh, the site can automatically go, hey, you need the font API, uh, the Google font API source. Um, so if you enable it, it's going to kind of protect you to make sure that anything that is in a library is included automatically. Um, if you have other sources that you need to add to this, um, obviously one of the limitations is those font files themselves. The libraries don't define that they need to load fonts. Um, and then for some other things, if you're loading, uh, you know, if you're adding iframes onto your page, you might not be doing that with anything that uses a library. So the libraries don't, like, there isn't a library to define a lot of these other directives. Um, so it is going to require some manual configuration for these uh, more specific items. Um, like I said, you know, blocking images or rich media, if you want to take care of those, those are something that you're going to have to enable, like, manually on your own and then configure it as needed to, to block those items. And uh, as I mentioned, adding uh, those reports into the site log, uh, there's a few different options for kind of where those reports go to. Report URI is a third-party service. They have a free tier um, if you want to test it out. Uh, and then kind of a paid service if you are supporting a lot of websites or, or high volume. Uh, the quickest one is just to dump it into the site log uh, really convenient to get started on a website, but um, I mean, ultimately, if you have a high traffic website uh, and you forget to add that font URL, and every user to your website is now sending another dozen requests, uh, doing a full bootstrap just to dump something in the log, uh, not the greatest uh, uh, kind of system behind the scenes. Hopefully, you don't have too many reports, uh, but it can add a fair amount to your web to your, of load to your website if you know, you have a misconfiguration. Uh, so I would also recommend if you're kind of playing around with the module to start with, open your browser console, disable the logging back to your website itself, and then get it into the best state as possible before you enable this logging. Um, you can just send it to an arbitrary URI, so if you have another service or um, you just implementing your own system for logging things quickly and, and easily, you can uh, add in your own endpoint for it. 
Uh, so in the site log, this is what it looked like. It just sends a JSON blog blob uh, back. Uh, it tells what uh, URL the user was on. So a little bit easier to debug if you know certain JavaScript only loads on certain pages of your website. You're not hunting down where the user is. Uh, gives you what policy they actually kind of experienced, what was actually blocking the content, and which particular portion of it was hitting that block. So in here, uh, it's saying that the, the font source one wasn't defined, it's falling back to the default source. Um, so a little bit of sleuthing to figure out, do I need to change that default one or add a more specific one? Um, but it gives you reports. Uh, and then as well, the first line there is saying that this was a, a report only policy. So this isn't, you can at least know for here that you're not affecting users directly just yet. Um, so when you are updating your policies and tweaking them, you know which one, which one to adjust. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, you can send both, uh, have one more strict than the other one, so if you just want to get off <coughs> to a simple start and saying, hey, we just want to make sure everything's loaded over a secure connection, uh, that's what we're going to force, block any unsecure uh, requests that go out, and then we're going to test what happens if we go in that stricter mode. Uh, give it some time to, to see what happens. Uh, and then I mentioned that service report URI. Uh, so if you enable it within the module, it gives you a couple links uh, to where you need to sign up. You give it kind of a subdomain. It gives you a custom uh, random one to start with, but you can add it to a unique one. Uh, and they also have a wizard mode. Uh, and that one, you just enable it. Uh, by default, you just can restrict everything. And it actually tries to collect everything that you would encounter builds out an example policy for you, you can implement that policy and then tweak it as you go. Um, they have API limits on their default uh, kind of reporting system, but the wizard one has like an absurdly high uh, rate limit, just so when you get started that you don't kind of lock yourself out of your account and make it useless for the next <laughs> month until your rate limit uh, rolls over. Uh, there are a couple issues, though, uh, kind of implementing it. One of the biggest ones for kind of getting optimal security uh, on your website is that, uh, at least in Drupal core, this is kind of the only big one that I know about, is that CK Editor 4 still uses onclick attributes within HTML for a lot of its functionality. Um, so by default, when you just enable the content security policy, unless you add the unsafe inline keyword, any inline JavaScript is blocked, whether it's a script element directly added onto the page or it's something like those on-click attributes. Um, so because CK Editor requires it for now, you have to enable that directive and that severely hampers what else the content security policy is able to block. Uh, it can't tell the difference right away between good inline JavaScript from CK Editor and bad inline JavaScript pasted into a, a text field. Um, there is some progress, it's a little slow. The plan is to introduce a second module just for CK Editor 5, um, but it does have quite a, some big architecture changes, so that is going to be a pretty big project. And then uh, once that's in place, CK Editor 4 version of the module will be, will be deprecated in Drupal 9 at some point. And then ideally, Drupal 10, the CK Editor 4 version will be removed. Um, so that might be something to consider like in the upgrade path in your Drupal 9 site's lifetime. Uh, hopefully, it, it's a smooth transition, but uh, that's one limitation. Uh, but at the very least, uh, supported by version 3 of the spec, so Chrome is the, currently the only one, I believe, that supports this is that you can be a little bit more specific about where you trust those scripts from. So uh, there's a higher risk from just arbitrary script elements being added to the page. They're pretty unrestricted in what they can do. Whereas on-click attributes, um, obviously they have to be triggered in a certain sort of way. They, there's some limitations on what sort of operations that they can do within JavaScript itself. Um, so at least with CK Editor, you can allow those inline attributes um, so that CK Editor continues to work, and then have a better restriction on those element tags. Um, so there's still a little bit of exposure uh, of risk for inline JavaScript, but it definitely mitigates part of that. Um, 
So this, uh, I think in the future, will be kind of the default configuration that's enabled from the content security policy module when you enable it. Um, it uh, kind of is backwards compatible. Firefox will give you a warning of like, oh, I don't understand this element directive. Um, but for uh, Chrome and as browsers, as they sort to adopt it, they will kind of get better protection as things go along. Uh, another challenge, uh, like I said, one of the ways around uh, kind of the library's restrictions is just kind of pasting inline JavaScript into the template. So something like this, uh, where you're calling uh, an analytic system or, or something like that, they just give you this snippet and say, hey, add this to the head of your, your page and things will start to work. Uh, this sort of snippet is actually written to support Internet Explorer 8 because they didn't support the async contribute on scripts yet. Um, so instead, to get started, uh, that script can be included directly, use the async attribute. Um, using it in this format allows you to define it in the library's file in a module. Um, so it can be automatically detected by the CSP module. And then for any kind of unique code beyond that is that you have a wrapper script for your own initialization, again, included through uh, an external JavaScript file on your own website. Um, you will need probably a snippet pr from the provider. Uh, this example is based off of Google Analytics, uh, where they initialize basically an array where you can queue up operations uh, as soon as the page is loaded, and then when their library loads in after the fact, then it actually goes through that queue and, and does the actual operations. Um, so it's just setting up uh, kind of that initial queue, uh, and then we're adding anything through Drupal settings. We're adding kind of, an ex here we're gonna have uh, an escaped API key just to initialize it uh, called within the function, um, and we don't have to worry about pasting anything into the, the head of the document. Uh, as an example, you can, there's, uh, this is my alternate version uh, module for Google Analytics that uses this method. Everything, any data that's needed by the front-end JavaScript is passed through the Drupal settings system. Uh, and uh, it doesn't use any inline JavaScript at all. I think it also has a much better API if you're doing any kind of programmatic analytics, but separate talk it. Uh, as always, I always encounter the, the pushback. Uh, there's an issue queue going on for a long time of people who are really upset that the, le the asset system in Drupal 8 doesn't support inline JavaScript anymore. Uh, and people still continue to push back. Uh, in most cases, it's probably not needed. There are a couple options if you really do. Um, so the first one is uh, allowing content by hash. Uh, this one is a little bit fragile in certain ways because you add JavaScript onto the page, you hash the contents of whatever is in your script tag, um, and then add it to your header, and that specific script with that specific content is allowed. If any alterations, if someone typed in some changes, updated a value within that script, if it was in your uh, uh, content somehow, uh, then it would all of a sudden be blocked. Um, so ideally you would want to have a programmatic system to be able to flag which ones are allowed, uh, generate the hash correctly, and, and then add it to your header. Um, so yeah, that one's a little bit more fragile. And then as well, the more inline JavaScript elements that you have on the page, the more hashes you need, the longer your header gets. Uh, the slightly better one here is using a nonce. So this is a randomly generated string. Uh, you add it into attributes on every script tag that you want to allow, and then you add that same value into the header. And this is flagging that when you're generating the page, any script tags that have this nonce are allowed. Any scripts that have a different nonce value or are missing the nonce value, the browser goes, oh, this is probably injected somewhere unsafely, and I'm just not gonna run it. Um, Initially, I thought that this nonce had to be generated for each request, um, and caching would be a problem. I got to confirm this, but my understanding is that uh, if you're using something like a page cache, it actually would be safe to cache these nonces um, because the page is sent out 
with that same nonce every time, and someone shouldn't be able to inject anything into a pre-generated cached page. Um, so that's something that there might be a possibility here for an API to safely add inline JavaScripts with nonces. Uh, and not, and again, this blocks any other any scripts that are added onto the page. A uh, couple limitations for these, though, is that they don't work for element attributes um, or external scripts. So you can't kind of allow an ex a loaded external script from a separate site through the SHA hash. Uh, that's only supported in the newest browsers in level three of the spec, older browsers will just block that script because it doesn't, uh, it blocks loading the script before it downloads it to calculate the hash. Uh, whereas new browsers will download it, check if it matches, and then allow it or not. Uh, flip through a little quickly. Uh, for some of the advanced stuff, uh, one of the interesting things about Dribbble is that these files have a different level of trust associated with them. I mean, the first one is a core file. It's potentially on a read-only file system. It's deployed directly from you know, a packaged uh, archive of your site. Probably not going to have any changes to it. The second one is a generated file. Ideally, it's, you know, the, it's an aggregate of all of those trusted files. You know it's safe, but it is added to a read-only uh, or a read-write uh, folder on your file system that's uh, you know, these are continually updated, add, new files are added as pages update their JavaScript. Uh, and then finally, that last one, this is a general file in the files directory. Uh, Drupal has a system, if you try to upload a file ending on JS, it actually rewrites it and adds a dot text at the end to try and protect you. To say, hey, you're uploading what could potentially be a dangerous JavaScript file into a trusted location on your website. Um, yeah, but again, uh, kind of different levels of trust, and you probably don't want to allow all of those. Uh, so when you're specifying a policy, you can say, I only want to allow things in a particular subdirectory of my website. Uh, but obviously, this gets a little bit messy within Drupal. You, know, you have your core folder, modules, folder, themes, profiles. Uh, libraries that are added uh, for any third-party libraries, and then you have that specific trusted directory for your aggregated JavaScript CSS. That gets pretty messy. Um, so one of the things that I experimented with instead is to have a separate asset subdomain that only serves files from those trusted paths. It'll block requests for anything else. Um, and then that would be, and then uh, on the Drupal side, you would have to rewrite anything. So when it's adding those script takes to the header of your page, instead of using your kind of default domain of the website, it's using this asset domain. Um, and that's one way to have a short policy. You don't have to worry about updating or changing it if you, for anything. Um, and then you could do this. I broke it out probably much more than necessary. I actually had a separate domain just for loading. Okay, well, here's a safe domain for loading images from. Um, and each particular, not like JavaScript and CSS were, block, were grouped together. Um, but uh, that, I think, is a, a bit of a unique uh, concern for a site like Drupal or some other CMSs where you have this kind of very trust on the very same domain. Uh, another one is that if you're loading things from a third party, um, I haven't seen it as a common request so much in the sites that I've worked on, uh, but there's these third party CDNs of like, hey, we get to load jQuery as fast as possible, faster than your website. Um, but of course, if you allow this site in your policy, you allow every JavaScript hosted on it. Any library can be loaded. Um, may not be particularly dangerous, but it can provide a lot of tools for someone to be able to do something that you don't want them to do on your website. Um, generally, because they are hosting so many things, you know, it's grouped by what library is actually being installed, so you could use that path to limit it. Uh, but the challenge here is that uh, for something like jQuery, there's older versions with security issues, and you're not blocking those older versions from being loaded on the page, overwriting the newer version that you include by default, and potentially that allows an attacker to utilize that security vulnerability kind of down the line. 
You can go more, more specific. They have to include a version in the path uh, in most cases um, to be able to protect things. Um, but then you have to keep, you know, there's an extra maintenance burden keeping these versions in place, making sure that someone doesn't update the library uh, that they intend to include, and then all of a sudden it's blocked by the policy that is protecting things. Um, so this is one, one place where nonces can still be a benefit, even on, on external scripts. Um, so you're including not just everything from that CDN, but you're only saying, hey, this particular script tag, because it has this nonce value applied to it, is being allowed, but otherwise nothing else is being allowed from that particular domain. It's all just you know, my own trusted domain. Uh, flip through a couple of related technologies. Uh, one of the challenges with content security policy is it says, where do I trust things from, but not what do I trust it to do. Uh, so sub-resource integrity is uh, one step to say, okay, well, you know, with that uh, crypto miner is that, well, that file changed without my knowledge. There was a version of it that I trusted, and I don't want to run it if it changes from that version that I trust. Um, this requires that they provide you a versioned uh, instance. You know, here we have that, that version in the URL. Uh, and this is what that provider actually changed to, is that when you go to copy their script now, they say, hey, you're getting this version of our file with this particular version URL, and you're getting this integrity value, which is a hash of the contents of the file. If that ever changes and the browser loads whatever modified version of that file, it's just blocked. The browser will basically treat it as if it was a 404 response. Um, and then it also integrates with content security policy. If you want to get a little bit more uh, strict, it is that you can actually require it so that anything on the page that doesn't have this integrity value is blocked. Um, I think within Drupal, there's definitely an opportunity for it to, like the library system can define these hashes. They can be included. Um, and I think even uh, for Drupal, it could actually compute the hash to say, okay, well, we've got all of our source scripts with our hashes, we're going to aggregate them together. We know what the hash for that aggregate should be, and it should be able to do it, uh, calculate for those aggregate files, uh, which would be helpful. Uh, this as well, similar to the content security policy, has been broadly supported. Um, Edge has a warning if it's only got partial support, but I, I apologize, I don't know what specifically that means. Um, but across other browsers, it is supported. And uh, one of the other ones is feature policy. This gets a little bit more into what specifically you allow, um, is that it allows, you know, what lo particular location is allowed, what particular browser features, particularly where you're extracting information from the browser, uh, where there might be privacy risks. So for example, here we're saying our website needs to pull in a user's geolocation, but we don't want any third-party scripts to be able to do that as well. And then we never want our site to ask the user for access to their camera or microphone. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other options for kind of what information you pull out of the browser. Uh, it's not defined in the spec so that it can be a little bit more flexible and, and some new ones are being added uh, even over the previous few months. Um, supported by Chrome, uh, some of the newest ones that it allows uh, are behind a feature flag in Chrome. So they're not like most people wouldn't get them, but they, uh, they will potentially be enabled in the future. Future, uh, Firefox, everything is behind a feature flag. So can't quite protect users with Firefox with feature policy just yet, but uh, ideally in the future once that feature flag goes away. Uh, one of the limitations though to be aware of for feature policy is that there is no report only mode. Um, there is only an enforced mode. As soon as you add it to your website, you're potentially blocking JavaScript from being able to do things. Um, so it is a little bit risky there, but again, it does uh, feed into uh, that reporting system. You will get messages on your site log of what's going on. Uh, and finally, for the reporting API, uh, like I mentioned, uh, you know, blocking those fonts, and you get half a dozen requests to your website. Uh, reporting API standardizes kind of the reporting system of how your website can expect these things. So not just content security policy reports, but feature policy, uh, feature policy uh, some other systems as well. 
Um, network error logging is actually if a user has an issue getting to your website, whether it's a DNS lookup or you know whatever network failure that they encounter, uh, the browser will actually cache a report of that, and then when it can access the site again, it'll send a report to your website to say, hey, users are having whatever issues with DNS not resolving for whatever reason. Um, so it can even give you other insight into different areas where your website might be having issues um, that you just wouldn't see traffic before previously. Um, it's enabled through a header. Uh, CSP, since it is kind of older than the reporting spec, needs a specific endpoint configured to be able to separate out what are CSP reports from everything else. Uh, but all the other types of reports uh, have both a type that specifies this is from feature policy, this is from network error logging, and then as well whether it was um, enforced or just a report only. And then content security policy, it's a new directive to reference that report to header to say this is where items are getting sent to. Um, so Chrome, since it supports uh, the reporting API, um, it'll send it to you know, your reporting endpoint, whereas other browsers will fall back to the report URI value. Uh, as I mentioned, Chrome is the only one that supports it now. Firefox has uh, some concerns about implementing it. Um, so it's kind of lagging behind. And uh, of course, there's a module for that. Uh, it's still in beta. It basically just report, records everything to the site log now. Um, so it's not much different than the content security policy module itself does, but this enables it for those additional features. Um, and then uh, for full features, it should be able to defer to something like the report URI service, which has a lot more features. Um, but that, that is down the line. So uh, it works. It's a good start. Double that up. Uh, as I mentioned, once you enable the reporting API, it gives you this extra option in the, the CSP module configuration to say, hey, I want to send it to, to this particular one that I have configured. So the reporting API module requires the, the other the content module? Uh, they are completely separate, but they work together if you enable both of them. Um, so yeah, the reporting API has a plugin for the CSP module, and the CSP module has some default configuration for the reporting API uh, that it's really cool how it works together once you enable everything. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's <laughs> uh, a couple questions. Uh, what, okay, the big question I have is this network logging. Is that an, op an opening for a denial of a service attack? Uh, that's definitely a risk with any sort of reporting on this kind of thing. I mean, like any endpoint on your website, it just accepts, uh, I believe, they're post requests. Uh, behind the scenes, but that's an opportunity, yeah, where someone can submit a bunch of regular data to your website. So, uh, Drupal site log, probably not the place to handle that. Uh, the reporting API module is a place to better do that within Drupal. Not quite there yet, but then there is those sort of third party services like Report URI, um, where they definitely have implemented, you know, those limitations, rate limiting. Uh, they do block a lot of bots. They do understand a lot of kind of the false reports that they can filter out safely. Um, so if it is a concern where you are getting swamped with messages, that, that definitely is a service that can be very helpful to, to limit that. Will some of these uh, reports go to your, um, your web server logs if, if you happen to be able to get your Drupal log? Um, it just uses the default um, kind of re logging system within Drupal. So if you don't use the DB log module, but you use the syslog module, it'll go to your syslog. Uh, that's if you enable the reporting API module. Yeah. But if, if you if you don't don't do any of that, if you, if you just set a content security policy and, and then things are blocked, does, does that get reported to web server uh, logs? Yeah. So if you if you enable the policy, if you don't have the directive to say where reports should go to, the browser, if you, you look in the console, the browser will actually give you a warning to say, hey, I have nowhere to send reports to. Um, and they don't get sent anywhere just because the browser doesn't know where to send it. Um, there's sort of no default URL on your website for it to send it to. Um, so, so the browser has to initiate the report. It's yeah. done by the web server. Yeah. Yeah, uh, with regard to that unsafe inline, is there a way to craft that so that 
it only allows unsafe in line for CK editor four. Uh, yeah. So for CK editor, I looked into that. The challenge is that every on click contribute that it adds to the page has a unique value within it. So it goes like, hey, I'm clicking button number one, or this is button number two. Um, so you can't use nosh you can't use nonces for those inline attributes, and using uh, hashes uh, in level two of the spec, they only work on script elements. Level three of the spec uh, has another attribute, um, unsafe hashes, that allows it for those inline attributes. But then CK Editor could be adding 10 buttons onto a page.